I need polling numbers that actually show that I'm competitive with President Trump and President Biden. And I, you know, I think that that's happening. I'm already, there's a, I think it's a Quinnipiac poll showing me at 27 points in Michigan. So that's within, you know, all I need to do is take two points from each of them and I, I win and I have seven months to do that, uh, 26 points in Arizona. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to happen that I'm already beating President Trump, and President Biden among young people. So people under 45 in the battleground states, people under 35 nationally. I'm beating them when the, in the, with the biggest cohort, which is independent voters. In, but this is the first, Dave, this is the first uh, election in United States history or modern history where independents have uh, have outpolled self-identified independents are a larger party than either Republicans or Democrats. Self-identified independents are now 43% of the electorate um, versus 27 who say they're Democrats, 27 who say they're Republicans. And I'm winning in that cohort, which is the biggest. <laughs> So in a weird way, your campaign is sort of, in some respects, fighting human nature to always be worried about everything in a certain respect, but also fighting an algorithmic manipulation at the same time. So how do you peel off the people on both sides? I think that's what most people are wondering. I mean, most of my audience, I think, absolutely could vote for you, but they're going, all right, well, how, what, how, what does the path look like? What, what is the road to the promised land? Yeah, and I think my challenge is to achieve two things. One is, you know, the the big impediment that people, that the mainstream media and, you know, other media um, says about me is that there's no way that I can get on the ballot everywhere. And, you know, we're going to show very quickly that we can get on the ballot everywhere, and we're going to do that very quickly. Much We're going to probably do at least two states over from now on till we get all of, you know, for the next 20 weeks, we're going to do. So two states a week for about 20 weeks. And then, week, and, and yeah. you believe you'll be on all 50. Yeah, I will be on 50 in 50 states and the district of Columbia. So that, you know, that's just a sort of a, a mechanical impediment that mm-hmm. I have to overcome. And I think that that, you know, for a lot of people that that's the biggest impediment. And then the other is uh, I need polling numbers that actually show that I'm competitive with President Trump and President Biden. And I, you know, I think that that's happening. I'm already, there's a, I think it's a Quinnipiac poll showing me at 27 points in Michigan. So that's within, mm-hmm. you know, all I need to do is take two points from each of them and I, I win and I have seven months to do that, uh, 26 points in Arizona. Um. So, you know, I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to happen that I'm already beating President Trump, President Biden among young people. So people under 45 in the battleground states, people under 35 nationally, I'm beating them when the, in the, with the biggest cohort, which is independent voters. In the, but this is the first, Dave, this is the first uh, election in United States history or modern history where independents have uh, have outpolled self-identified independents are a larger party than either Republicans or Democrats. Self-identified independents are now 43% of the electorate um, versus 27 who say they're Democrats, 27 who say they're Republicans. And I'm winning in that cohort, which is the biggest. The group that I'm very, that I'm weakest in, which is ironic, is boomers, mm-hmm. which is my generation. And I should be, you would think, right. he's strong there because they all remember Camelot and, you know, they're part of the Kennedy era. And I was also, uh, um, when I was known as the leading environmental champion, I was very, very popular with that cohort. Um, but the, my problem with them is that they're getting their news from ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, mm-hmm. MSNBC, and the Washington Post and the New York Times. And though, you know, if, if that's your ecosystem, your information ecosystem, you're going to have a low opinion on me. Did, and, did you think you were going to have to fight the machine the way you've had to fight it? Or did you think that just by, by name alone, if not resume, it was going to be a little kinder to you? 
And now I knew that I was going to be a fist fight because I had been doing this, you know, the vaccine stuff uh, for since 2005, and I know the heat that they can generate. Oh, I knew that it was going to be tough. The, the weird thing is my name, um, although, you know, clearly it's a, it's a, a, a net plus for me, um, but the people with whom I'm most popular are the people who know almost nothing about the Kennedys. They're, hmm. you know, they're Gen, Gen Z, they're millennials, and they, you know, for them, they they didn't grow up with a picture of my uncle and father over their fireplace. Their parents did. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't, and, and they don't really know anything about the Kennedys. They have a vague knowledge, but, you know, it's all, uh, I think, kind of a jumble for them. And they, they certainly didn't, uh, grow up with the kind of, you know, looking at the Kennedys with almost a deity status that a different generation of Americans did. So when I saw you, or last time I interviewed you was about six months ago or five months ago or so in LA, and I said to you that the day you announced, I said on my show that he may not be a Republican at the end of this thing, but he will not be a Democrat. <laughs> and it was only it was only a couple of months later yeah. that you officially are not a Democrat. Yeah, so if, if, you if you're not crazy. surprised... <laughs> Well, if you're not surprised, no, I had a really that, good time yeah. at that. At that, uh, um, yeah. You and I did a, like a fireside chat. It was yeah. really, really fun. And you know, I said to my staff, whenever we go to Florida, let's try to get on Dave's show because uh, uh, it was a very, very fun interview for me. Well, because I uh, well, I appreciate that, but I think also what I think the thing that unites us is a love of country. I think we both, I think, probably describe ourselves as classical liberals. And I think that that's what most of the country actually is. But it's that polarization that you're talking about with these two guys that is not allowing anyone else, it's not allowing people to think there's a way out. And I think that that's what we're left with. But so with that in mind, you aren't a Democrat anymore, but you are you are what your uncle and what your father represented with the Democrats. So where where do these people fit right now? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I had a I, I had a conversation this week with Aaron Burnett mm -hmm. on CNN, and um, I you know, if you took all the things that my father believed in or President Kennedy, my uncle believed in, I would check every one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm a classic Kennedy Democrat, um, and you know more. You know, I guess you'd call me a classic liberal, the last liberal. And I had this conversation with Erin Burnett, and um, and I'm very grateful to her for letting me on CNN. I'm sure that she took a lot of flack, and she gave me a fair interview. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm very very grateful. It's the first time in a decade that I've been on that <laughs> um, network and had a live interview that they couldn't, and you know, slice and dice. Yeah. I mean, Jake Tapper said that he will not interview you on his show. Yeah. He said that you're you're too. I don't know, I don't remember the exact words. Too conspiratorial or, or radical or something to that effect. I mean, that just tells you how out of touch they are. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's the prevailing attitude there that that they all tell each other and it's kind of i think it's an echo chamber so you know they believe that the propaganda the descriptions that they've been <laughs> propagating about me over the last 10 years um and they don't really want their audience to you know to to see me or hear me because they think i have dangerous thoughts or you know i'll put dangerous thoughts into the heads of the audience which is weird because, it, you know, in the old days, that's what journalism was about. Mm -hmm. It was about, you know, um, it, it was about having conversations and debating issues. And then, you know, if somebody was saying something absurd, letting that either win or die in the marketplace of ideas, you know, and reporters and journalists had enough confidence in their own opinions and their own judgment that they could sit there and make an argument rather than just saying, we're going to silence this person, we're going to cancel this person. But anyway, that's a, a different subject. But one of the, it's related though, because one of the things I said, she, she, uh, Aaron said to me, um, you know, she was talking about Trump being a threat to democracy. And I said, and Trump ironically had said that very morning, that Biden is such a threat to democracy that 
um, this will probably be the last election if he if he gets elected. But they say that about each other. Sure. And that's you know part of this game that they all that they're they're playing. They're they're trying to pump up fear. They're not. Ayn has three billion dollars that he's going to have, according to the New York Times, for this campaign more than any probably double any campaign in history. But he's not going to use that money to amplify his voice. He's going to use it to try to get Trump off the ballot, to try to get me off the ballot, to try to make sure that he doesn't have anybody to run against. And it's ironic because. The Democrats are all lambasting Vladimir Putin because he won 88% of the vote because he didn't have any opponents. But that's the situation they're trying to engineer for us with a party picks the candidate and then yeah. nobody else is allowed to run against him. But I said to, um, and she asked me, does, do I really, you know, don't I think Trump is very dangerous for the Republic? And I said to her, I can make an argument mm -hmm. that President Biden is even more dangerous to the republic. And she had this kind of astonished look where she, you know, her brain stopped working. Yeah. And um, and I said, you know, the reason for that, that I would say that is because President Biden did something no other president in history. And he'd been, a court has found it. Yeah. A court has no, there's no court that's found that President Trump um, tried to, uh, steal the election or tried to derail the election uh, or tried to um, start an insurrection. There may be plenty of evidence that he did that. There's no court that's found that, mm -hmm. but there's a, a courts that have found that President Biden was censoring his opponents mm -hmm. and not just me, though, although he did censor me and I did win that suit. So it's not me making it up. Yeah. And by the way, they were censoring me not because I was promoting misinformation because they I have not been able to point to a single post that I made that was factually erroneous and were very, very careful about making sure that everything I put up there, I think I have got the best fact-checking operation in journalism. We have 350 PhD scientists and, and MD physicians who are on an advisory board and look at the stuff we post. And, you know, I, everything I post is, is cited in source to peer-reviewed publications or to government databases. Uh, so they, in, in these conversations that you're watching between the White House censors and their, their, uh, their uh, compatriots at Facebook, um, the Facebook people are saying, well, actually what he's saying is, is factually correct. They had to come up with a new word to describe my post and the word is mal. It's not misinformation or disinformation. It's malinformation, mm -hmm. which are, is information that is factually correct, but it's nevertheless inconvenient for the government. So they were censoring me. Now, there's, there's, and, but they also were censoring, as you know. I'm on the list. Jim yeah. Jordan released the list. My name was on there. Right. Uh, related many, to the Twitter files. People. Yeah including people who had nothing to do with any kind of criticism of lockdowns or masks or mm -hmm. vaccines or any of that stuff. There are people who are, are criticizing the Ukraine war or, or, you know, the military industrial complex. And those people are now getting um, censored by the, by order of the president. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics, instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.